All right, this is Casey, and this is Casey's Roadmap to Success. This is a bully stick, and I'm gonna let her chew on this to keep her in the shot, at least initially. Uh, now, if you have a dog that uh, is uh, nervous or anxious, you wanna make sure they have plenty of things to chew on. Now, this is an, uh, an edible, but not a type of edible that uh, a lot of people reference. Um, giving your dog bully sticks, kneecaps, cow's ears, tracheas, cod skins, things that they can chew on and are durable, but also they can ingest, are a great way to, for a dog to self-soothe. Dogs chew to kind of calm themselves. Now, um, basically, uh, she is an insecure dog, and I uh, talked in the video above this uh, about her separation anxiety. Um, I referenced in that video a couple other things that we went over in the session. I'm going to try to highlight and cap on those uh, in this video. Um, for dogs that have separation anxiety, a lot of times they perceive themselves to be in charge of the humans. And they get that perception because of how the humans interact with them. And Casey here is a classic example. She really didn't have any rules. She was under exercise. She gets more exercise actually than most of my clients, but not as much as she probably needs. And then she's able to tell her humans when to pet her. So if a dog uh, uh, thinks it doesn't have any rules, it sees you as a peer. And if it sees you as a peer, the listening to is optional. But if a dog is able to tell you what to do and you do it, it starts to see you as being subordinate to them. And then the job, dog's job might be to protect you. Now she's a herding breed, and so a part of her DNA is to be in charge. Now, uh, the reason that I got called in is we have a, uh, a young man in the neighborhood who uh, is a great little kid, but doesn't listen, and he opens doors and he let her out. She got loose and ended up through a simple, kind of a cacophony of errors, ended up nipping someone who was on a motorcycle. She doesn't like motorcycles. Now, a lot of uh, herding breeds also don't like motorcycles, skateboards, and things like that because that's just what, you know, they see something moving fast, they perceive it as a threat, they want to nip it to correct it. Now, the good news is she didn't draw really draw any blood and she left a bruise. Dogs, when they bite to correct, they typically do, do it with the consistency of the same severity of the bite. So the fact that she didn't draw blood, even though we don't want her to bite anyone, is a good sign. And from what, I just, what I've observed, I don't see any aggression in her whatsoever. Um, and uh, from what I understood, she had what we call trigger stacking, several things that happened in a row that probably elevated her stress level, and then she finally reached a tipping point, just like all of us do. So um, now I went over some, uh, some suggestions for the child that lives across the street because uh, eventually, if he lets her out in the wrong situation, that could turn out really badly and it wouldn't be her fault. Um, now, the kid doesn't mean anything, any harm by it, but at the same time, if we have something that's going on, it's our responsibility to make sure we provide a safe environment for the dogs as well as for our neighborhood. So hopefully the guardians uh, can have a conversation with uh, that child and their parents and come up with a working solution that are gonna, that's going to uh, solve that problem. Now, uh, for her problems, a lot of uh, her insecurity probably comes from the perception that she has the same authority as her humans. And a lot of that is because dogs go through life probing to determine where boundaries and limits are. But if we don't have uh, any boundaries or limits or rules, we're not consistent. And if we're not consistent, it makes it really hard for dogs to learn because they learn through consistency, repetition, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward your dog for them to have the ability to make the connection. But even in that three seconds is not enough. It has to be repeated over and over and over again. So uh, the way that I flip what I call the leader follower dynamic, one of the ways I do it, is by incorporating some rules. And uh, these are not arbitrary rules, these are rules that actually have some substance and meaning for the dogs. One of the first rules I suggest is not being allowed in the furniture. Now for these rules, I need to preface this by saying that uh, we have a family of uh, five people. If some of the people in the ha house are on, on board with this stuff and other people do not, the other people who are not are going to undermine uh, the people who are. So it's if for the safety of the dog and benefit of the dog and the family, I would suggest everybody is very militant and on the same page with all these rules for the next month minimum or as long as these problems are going on. But it has to be at least 30 days with the dog not being able to do these things. One of the first rules I usually suggest, no furniture for 30 days. Because for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social standing that they have. If we let dogs sit at the same height as us, that's one of the ways that we say we're peers. And again, if a dog sees you as a peer, the listening to you is optional. So um, I would first rule would be no, not allowed on the furniture for 30 days or as long as the problem's still going on, and then furniture with an invitation and only for good behavior. Um, rule number two, uh, the dog has to sit at the door before I open the door. I go to the door and I say sit one time. And if you're petting her and she does this, make sure you immediately stop petting her. If she puts her paw on it, that's a dominance move. It's okay right now because I'm holding something. Um, Actually, before I go there, I um, want to teach her to drop. Now, she already knows how to drop, but when they're playing fetch, the guardians, I think, take it from her because she doesn't willingly want to drop. 
Now, for dogs, it's fun to be chased. And uh, because she needs more exercise, I love to see her having uh, the ability to play fetch. So what we do is when the dog has an item in its mouth, now this is a higher value item because it's ingestible and she doesn't have access to it. When she has toys that she's allowed to have at any point, she's got one in her mouth, take a treat and touch her nose with it. Now she'll try to take it with the object in her mouth, just wait, don't give her any commands or any prompts. As soon as she spits it out, pop the treat in her mouth and say the word drop. Do this with what we call low value items, toys that she's allowed to have at any point in time. After you can shape this behavior enough with low value items, then eventually when she has a remote control or the fetch ball or whatever it is, and we say drop, she is programmed to spit it out because that means that we're gonna give her a reward. And when she does drop the item, don't pick it up. Let her drop it and don't show any interest in it, put the treat in her mouth and don't pick it up. When we're shaping the behavior, we want her to understand first, the human doesn't even want my stuff. They just want me to, to give me a treat. I spit this out, they give me a treat and I get my stuff back. Yeah, 99% of the time. Now, if she does get to the point where we do have to take a remote control or something from her away from her, that's when we want to have a bully stick or something like this. We have her drop, and then we give her something of equal or greater value. Now, if we practice the, the drop of low value items enough, then eventually we should be able to get her to drop and play fetch with us. Um, if you have questions on playing fetch, let me know. I have a video I can send to the family that covers how I teach a dog to fetch on command. Now, uh, just, uh, getting back to the rules, another rule that I have is I make the dog sit at a door. I go to the door and I say, sit once. Remember, the more you say a command, the less you mean it. So I go to the door and I say, sit. And I tell it in a, a kind of a command, not an ask. A lot of people, can you sit? The dog's like, no. So sit, I count to three in my head. If the dog doesn't sit by the time I hit three, I turn around, walk away, sit down somewhere, pull up a magazine, pull out your phone, watch a little TV, do whatever you want, and wait one minute. Then go back to the door and again, tell her, sit. She doesn't sit and I walk away for two minutes, next time for four minutes, then for eight minutes, and as soon as she sits when I say sit, I open that door like there's remote control in her butt. Now, once the dog, uh, after a while, the dog will go sit at the door as its way of asking me to go out. Once she's doing this, then I'd like the family to do the door exercise that I just showed them off camera, which is making the conditioning the dog to stay at the door even though I'm opening the door. And that will help with the young man who comes over and leaves the door open, just teaching her not to run, away, run out the open door. Uh, so we're kind of attacking the problem with multiple angles. Uh, now another rule for dogs to be within seven feet of a human who is eating food is a way of challenging for that food. Even if they're not actively begging, the presence is just inappropriate. And for dogs, eating is the most important activity that they participate in. So um, I'd like the guardians to make sure that they stop free feeding her, put food in her bowl, make sure whoever's feeding her takes a bite, five or more bites of something or a real meal. Then we give her permission to eat the food that's in her bowl. And once she gets permission, she has three minutes. Anytime she walks away, we pick up the bowl, we dump it and put the empty bowl back down. She does not eat again until the next meal. It's important to put the empty bowl back down. And after a while, she sees the human eats first, so the human has, must have more status than she does. And also we're controlling something that's very important, careful your finger, and uh, uh, that uh, will help her respect the humans even more because they're providing this nourishment and they're controlling the situation. And after enough time, she'll just wait for that command word. Or you can use passive training. Remember, she takes the first bite of food, say feast, or whatever the command word is. And after a while, you'll be able to say feast, and that means she gets to eat food. Uh, now, because uh, getting too close to us when we're eating food is, uh, is a challenge or inappropriate in the dog world, we want to make sure we don't give her any people food. If we give her people food, it should be separate from the table and uh, in her bowl or something like that. Now, I'm friends with her vet or uh, co-worker or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I love her vet. She's an awesome person. Um, and she recommends uh, carrots, and uh, which are awesome because the dog can ingest them and they're dense. Broccoli florets are also good to put in the dog's food once a week because broccoli and, and carrots help ward off two types of cancer that are prevalent in dogs. Now, getting her some other uh, high chew items like this bully stick that she's really enjoying now, uh, kneecaps and the rest of those things can also be beneficial if we give her one of those things when there's a mild distress, something going on mildly that she doesn't like, like the drill. Now, I went over, uh, well, actually, let me back up, let me continue on the rules and then I'll jump to the drill. So for the rules, another rule should be she should not be allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food or in the dining room when we're eating food at the table. When we're not preparing food or not at the table, she can be in those rooms without a problem. Now you're gonna use the escalating consequences to move her back. That third escalating consequence, march deliberately at the dog until the dog backs up across the boundary and then stop at that point. Wait for the dog to be stationary. When the dog's stationary, take two steps backwards, left foot, right foot, and stop for a second. When you move back, it's probably gonna prompt the dog to move forward. Once it crosses the line, you hiss and rush at it right away. And you do this back and forth until the dog kind of starts staying behind the line. Now this is something I promised to go over mom, with mom earlier and I forgot, so I'm gonna go through it in this video. She'll be able to get some new information because she's not in the room right now. So what I like to do is I like the dog practice things. 
I showed them how to practice at the door. Well, we can do the same principle when we're actually preparing food in the kitchen because the dog is inclined to want to come in the kitchen. So what we do instead is before we actually start cooking, we grab a piece of bacon and we microwave the piece of bacon and we put the bacon on the counter. Now the dog's like, mmm, bacon. And that smell is gonna attract the dog's attention. Then mom or whoever's in the kitchen is gonna pretend like they're cooking, simulate cooking. And we're grabbing pots and opening the fridge and pulling stuff out and putting it down. Anytime the dog starts to come out, come in the kitchen, we rush at the dog. So we're helping the dog practice doing a warm-up session. You have to stay out of the kitchen while we're preparing the food. And then once the dog sits or lies down beyond the boundary, then mom can put the bacon away and then go back to actually cooking the real meal. Now we help the dog practice the behavior when we were able to give it our full attention. When we're cooking, our attention is not going to be full. So now we've put the dog in a position to succeed. Do the same thing with dinner. Just uh, pretend like uh, get a piece of roast beef, microwave it, have everybody sit in the normal places, cut it up and put it on each people's plate, pretend like we're cutting it, and maybe put a piece of painter's tape down between the two rooms so the dog knows where the boundary is. And if the dog crosses the boundary, whoever's closest gets up and rushes right at the dog. As soon as the dog gets across the boundary, we stop. Now, if you figure out what the escalating consequences are, if you need uh, an example of how to practice what I just described about the kitchen, let me know and I can send you a video. Uh, now, I also went over the importance of rewarding her for desired actions and behaviors. We want to pet a dog. It's healthy to pet a dog. It's healthy for the dog. It's healthy for us. But petting a dog when it's doing something we don't like is amplifying and reinforcing that. Also, petting a dog when it's in an unbalanced state of mind, like fear, stress, anxiety, or excitement, is going to reinforce that. Now, when mom comes home, she gets to, she likes to talk to the dog in kind of a baby talk, a baby sort of voice, and gets the dog a little bit worked up. Well, just like us, we're not going to dogs aren't going to think as well when they're in an unbalanced state of mind. So we want to make sure that when we come home, we just ignore her completely. Now, when she gets calm, then we can turn to start engaging with her. When she starts getting excited, we pull back and we go on about our business. We don't tell her no. What we're saying is, when you're calm, I'm interested in, in engaging with you. When you're excited, I don't lose, I don't have any appeal or interest in playing with you. And after enough of the, I call this light switch on, light switch off, but enough of this stopping with the right energy, as soon as she starts getting excited, she will start staying calmer faster and uh, start to stay in a calm state of mind because that's what gets the human's attention. Now, I went over a version of this at the door when I first got here for the session, um, sh showing one of the guardians to hold, uh, step on the leash and stay right out, have the guest stay right outside the dog's reach and go back and forth. As soon as the dog sits and is calm, we turn towards the dog and start petting. As soon as the dog gets excited, we step to the side and turn sideways, just right outside of their reach. And after enough time, the dog will learn to stay in that calm state. Now, the other version of this is to just have the person step immediately right outside the front door, close the inside door so the dog can see the person. But this is the fourth quadrant of operant conditioning, also referred to as a negative punishment. So as soon as I get excited, the humans leave. As soon as I'm calm, the humans come back in and start petting me. Well, I like it when they pet me, so I'm going to start engaging in that behavior. Now, petting with a purpose and passive training are the two easiest things that anybody can do to help train their dog. Petting with a purpose is she comes up and she wants something from me, or I want to pet her, sit, sit. Again, I would stop that, there you go. And I pet under the chin, and I just say the word sit. Not good sit, not her name and sit, just sit. Um, if she's already sitting, I might ask her to, oh, sit. And I'm gonna well, I'd pat her and say sit. Or if she's sitting here, I can ask her to come sit over here or ask her to lay down or do something else on command. Now, after a while, what will happen is that I will start coming and sitting in front of the humans to prepay for attention. When she does that, we need to make sure we recognize that. So make sure we point that out. If we see a family member, she goes and sits in front of somebody, that person needs to start petting her within that three second window. Now, that leads me to passive training, which is the easiest way to train any dog. It's just simply waiting for the dog to do the behavior voluntarily without any interference so every time the dog comes to you, pet it and say, come. Every time it sits down next to you, pet it and say, sit. The guardians haven't been able to teach her how to lay down. Well, every time she lays down at your feet, pet her and say, chill or crash or whatever the word is that you want to use. Now, we have three kids in the house. I would suggest that the kids come up with funny words for these commands. Now, you could say meatball means roll over, but I would get something that means, you know, like stunt man or stunt dog, and then the dog rolls over. So if you come up with some funny commands like that, it makes it more engaging uh, for your guest. Uh, the dog feels better about herself, and it's just an easy, easy way to help the dog boost the dog's self-esteem and confidence. Now, uh, she also doesn't only, she only knows a couple of commands. Now, the stay command that I went over in the video above is a hard command, but it'll be really helpful for her separation anxiety problem. But teaching her how to roll over, 
put her nose, uh, her tree, uh, hand on her nose, or play dead, or balance a treat on her nose, or fetch slippers, or whatever these things are, can be really beneficial. It'll boost her self-esteem, it'll help her respect the person that's teaching her that command. So what I would recommend is uh, each one of the kids picks four tricks or commands. And then each week, one of the kids on Sunday, it takes over and I'm gonna teach her how to bang your dead. And make sure it's not too hard of an exercise. And then that person teaches her how to do it and then shows everybody else in the family how to do it and tells them what the command word is. And that week we practice that one command over and over and over again. The next Sunday, one of the, ne the next kid comes over and teaches her a different trick or command. At the end of three months, the dog will have 12 new tricks or commands, which will really boost her self-esteem and also build her respect for the kids because the kids are the ones helping teach her these things. Um, let me see, what else? Um, I'm gonna go with this hand for a little bit. Um, the guardians were free feeding her. I like them to go to a structured feeding. Um, message me if you forget how to do that and I can send a, share a video for that. Also, I went over showing them how to do a focus exercise. For the focus exercise, we'd like to practice that at least once a day with each person in the family. That way she gets five practices. Remember, at first it's one second, one second, but after a while it's one second, two seconds. And each person should practice with 12 treats. Uh, uh, I would grab six of the treats that I'm leaving and split them in half. Um, and then practice it in different parts of the house and eventually get to the point where within a week you can go 15 seconds of delivering that before you put the treat in the dog's mouth and it's staring at focusing you in the face. And if you forgot how to do that one, like I said, let me know and I can share a video for you. Now, uh, the, the guardians do not have a fenced in yard, so I'd really like to see them start an exercise journal for her. Um, scent games, Google scent games, it's a great way for it to burn energy, causes her to use her brain. Um, she likes to chase a laser, so run her up and down the stairs and count that as one. Maybe she needs, what I would do is probably the first time, take her up there when she's got no food in her stomach, dogs have a distended stomach, so never exercise a dog with food in the stomach, they can actually flip it over and can pressurize and explode. Yes, and she has a great high five. So when she does that, I would use passive training. So she's right up here, she's gonna, when she does it again, uh, then I can click and give her the command word. And of course, you're not gonna do it high five, or five, or whatever it is. And after a while, you'll be able to get this as a command. She's already doing it, five. And then, and then, five. Now she's like, I'm not quite ready to. So when she's doing it on her own, now she wants this, that's why she's pawing at it. So I'm gonna have a treat. Well, I would, let me do that again. So I'm holding it here, and I'm waiting for her, and it's gonna be hard to see because of uh, yeah, where the camera is. Thank you, camera person is helping me out. So we're waiting. Five. So now there's other ways to teach this, but, uh, and I usually recommend don't teach the dog to shake because she already likes to put her paws up on us, and that kind of will confuse her. I, I, I call that wave adios. My dog, I teach to wave, and they go, adios. Well, I don't say the adios part. Uh, but the focus exercise is something we'd like everybody to practice once a day for a week. By the end of the week, you'll be able to say focus, she'll drop what she's doing and look up at you. Um, now, uh, the last thing is, uh, because, uh, going back to the exercise journal, write down the date at the time, uh, at the top, and then write down the time, how long the walk was, the time, how many fetches, the time, how many up and downs the stairs, uh, how many uh, scent games or whatever we did. And the idea, and at the end of each day, crash. At the end of each day, we want to grade uh, the day. And maybe that was like a C plus day. The next day, well, maybe we add an extra game of fetch or add a couple repetitions to uh, the up downs or whatever it is. And eventually you get to the point where you have an A day and now you know what exercise she needs in order to be in a position to succeed. Now, if we have friends or people coming over, we wanna take her to doggy daycare or take her to the dog park and let her uh, burn off that excess energy so when the guests come, she's nice and chill and you're like, oh my God, your dog is so relaxed, what happened? You're like, of course, we hired David from Dog Gone Problems. He showed us how to prepare our dog for success. But it's just a little trick. We're just getting her the exercise that she needs to help her feel better and perform better. Five. Um, now we can also get her uh, five, yes, crash. Um, and also be careful how you say it. Try not to baby talk unless you always baby talk. Nothing wrong with baby talking, just being consistent with how we say the command. Use one word commands, don't use versions of it. A lot of us say, come, come here, over here, here girl, dog's name, whistle, tap my thigh, and something else. Now it's a whole bunch of extra words that she's gotta come up with. I'd like the family to come up with a list of the designated command words, and then if anybody's using a different word, we say maybe vocabulary. And I'm like, oh, come. So that way we make it easier for her to understand what's going on. Um, and then uh, we can get her a doggy, going back to exercise, we can get her a doggy backpack. 
put some bottles of water, some sand in there. That gives her a job to do on the walk and makes the walk more efficient. We can also, I'd like to see her going to the dog park at least once a week, but minimum of once a week. A couple of times a week would be even better. And if we're gonna have a lot of people over for maybe the 4th of July holiday or something like that, maybe we take her to the dog park multiple times. And maybe one of the kids takes her to the dog park, maybe the dad takes her to the dog park, and mom takes her to the dog park. By the time you have guests come over again, she's nice and relaxed. Um, okay, practice the, uh, the separation, the, the stay video, and desensitize her for the individual triggers for the, uh, that, uh, that help trigger her separation anxiety. Combining that with rule, enforcing rules consistently, rewarding desired behaviors, building up her confidence through new self-esteem, through learning new tricks and commands, uh, helping her practice staying and uh, desensitizing the triggers, all should help her relax reduce the cortisol levels in her blood, and help her just be a little bit more chill. Now, she's jump twitchy at times. You saw that little twitch when I touched her. That's because she has cortisol in her blood. So if you reach to pet her and she jumps like that, the first time you do, sit, then don't pet her. And when she does this, pull back. So every time the paw comes up, the hand goes away. Well, I like the hand scratching me, so I'll just leave the paw on the ground. So if you go reach to pet her and she jerks when you do it, pull your hand off. Make sure that she's not stressed out about a drill downstairs or a kid on their motorcycle or whatever it is. Okay, um, Casey, do you have any other questions? She's like, why don't you just give me that bully stick because I've already eaten half of it and you're not gonna give it to another dog. This is Casey. This is Casey's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.